Hello and welcome to the Oral Apothecary Podcast, authentic chat about medicines, pharmacy and healthcare in the UK. Pharmacist Jamie Gimmo and STC take on topical and controversial stories but keep it edgy yet light-hearted. Pod guests share their career-defining drug, song and book and also share their joyful patient stories. Welcome to the Oral Apothecary Podcast. My name is Jamie Hayes. For episode three of series six, we're joined by Sally Neath. Sally is the lead pharmacist for HIV, sexual health and hepatology at Swansea Bay University Health Board in South Wales. We will welcome Sally in a moment as she shares a drug for our formulary, her career anthem and recommends a book for the Oral Apothecary Library. Our micro discussion this week will be informed by a systematic review, Aging with HIV, Medicines Optimization Challenges and Support Needs for Older People Living with HIV. But first, let me welcome my two fellow apothecaries. STC is in Bournemouth and Gimmo is in Cardiff. Welcome both. Evening. Evening. What have you been up to? There's probably only one thing we want to talk about tonight, isn't there? And that was the um, triumphant oral apothecary live show in, in the chapter. Last, well, for us, it was the weekend before last. And it was a sellout. Yeah, the sellout. Medicine, music and memories. Sellout crowd. Turning people away. Telling people not to travel to avoid disappointment. And, and the big news was that not everyone there was mine or Jamie's friends or family. It was actually, I think, you know, a sizable proportion of the audience were the public who, you know, non-medical public. So it was, it was fab. We were, we, it was an experience. I think we were all nervous in the afternoon, weren't we? Jittered around the, the chapter, yeah. sort of making small talk. And... You know why? You know what I said to you, Gimmo? And let's be honest, Jamie did a stellar job, didn't he? At yeah, steering yeah. us through, you know, it was... Yeah some of the stuff that he does with the University of Third Age about talking to people about their medicines. But you and I were a little bit, ooh, not really sure. And what about the material? And I suppose the truth is that as somebody who likes to think of himself, not think of himself, is a control enthusiast, which is a phrase that I heard today, not a control freak, but a control enthusiast. I think that uh, we, I think you were a little bit the same. We felt like, well, we're not in control, so we weren't quite sure what was coming up. But he did a stellar job at, at steering us through. So, yeah, well done, Jamie. Had a lot of fun. It was great. And we had a great guest as well, didn't we? We, we maybe put, put some of his details. I think, well, we've put them on the website, haven't we? It's on the website. So, th- yeah, a big thanks to Dick Johns, our guest, for joining us, whose stories about a Pixaban. Blood thinner. Yeah, and his stories then about the... Um, the death of his his father uh, again that uh, that had the that had the audience. I, I think I think one thing I mean the fun aside and the fact you know we did raise quite a bit of money for charity as well was talking to a few people afterwards. They were, uh, you know, the public genuinely interested. I mean, it's probably what you experienced in the third age stuff, but actually genuinely interested in the stuff we were talking about, but also found it useful in terms of managing their whole health. So without blowing our own trumpet, which I know we do sometimes, I think we've got something, you know, that actually people are interested in. So I want to do it again. Yeah, we didn't get to talk about Angel's trumpet, though, did we? (laughs) Still got that in our locker. Still got that in our locker. A real moment for me, look, was right at the end of the night. And I knew it had gone well. uh, And you could see people were engaged. And we had lots of, we had some young people in the audience as well, didn't we? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And and right, so we right the way through the uh, the age brackets and, and the feedback from them was that they enjoyed it as well. Yeah, right at the end of the night when I went and thanked the sound and lighting engineers that look at, for looking after us, and one of them turned to me and he said how much he'd enjoyed the show, and I thought, it was great. and then he said, "I know what my desert island drug is," and so I thought that was that was great. So our our sound guy was and lighting guy; they were fully engaged in in listening to the the content as well, and sort of took part in it as well. Hang on, is that the guy who? We spent ages setting up, and when you went to play your videos, the sound didn't work. Is that the same one? You don't throw him under the bus. <laughs> don't, be, don't be mean. <laughs> they were great. But yeah, I know what my desert island drug is. So we'll do it again, yeah? Definitely. We must. Maybe down in Bournemouth, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm up for that. Oh, I've got one other thing. I've got to say this. Yeah, go on. How much do people enjoy the story from Rory Catherine Jones's book about Oblivion? No word of a lie patient last week difficult respiratory background started talking to them in their 80s completely i never said a word and she said oh yeah when i was a child they used to give me something called oblivion when i was having asthma attacks i nearly fell off my chair (laughs) that is great okay before we welcome our guest a quick shout out to our listeners around the world look we've back with series six and hello if you are listening in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Ireland, Singapore, Norway, South Africa, India, Greece, El Salvador, USA, France, Spain, Germany, Italy, Denmark and Belgium. 
and any others that I haven't mentioned. So thank you for your support. It's great to have you join us. Okay, let's move on. A great pleasure to welcome Sally Neath to the Oral Apothecary. In the early 90s, Sally began to work towards a PhD in drug delivery from dry powdered inhalers, but soon realised that lab work and research were not for her. Before moving into the world of HIV, hepatology and sexual health work, some of Sally's previous roles as an independent prescriber include anticoagulation services and helping to reduce the deaths caused by opioid overdose as part of a needle exchange service. Welcome to the podcast, Sally. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us. Look, in your bio as well, I didn't read this book, but um, you said to us, you're looking forward to sharing your thoughts on the testing, the treatment and how you've tried to influence your peers, colleagues and anyone who will listen on how living with HIV really is living. And not the apocalyptic death sentence many people still associate with the appalling don't die of ignorance adverts from the late 80s. I've been told I'm not to swear. So I'm just saying, yes, that flipping gravestone, it's um, it's caused a lot of heartache that that ad campaign. We remember it well, though, don't we? Yeah, well, there is that. But um, you're not remembering it for the right reasons or the reason behind it has changed so much. So sure. the, you know, the management of HIV, how we treat it, how we control it, our knowledge of it has just come on incredibly such a long way since the, the early 90s. Because that's interesting because at the time the advert would have been to promote safe sex, wouldn't it? Which I'd argue it was effective in doing. I would as well. I, I was a student at the time, so I could, you know. We're all of the same age here. Yeah. We all got the leaflet through the door, didn't we? But, but we did. But what you're saying is that it's had. It, that aside, it's had an impact on the treatment of patients or particularly how they're perceived. Exactly. So the idea of some of knowing somebody with HIV um, can be terrifying to some people or even I mean, I've worked with with colleagues who um, are genuinely scared t- to treat HIV patients. Um, I've had conversations with people that have that have just blown my mind at how unnecessarily um stigmatized patients living people living with hiv are it's uh and i mean i'll be honest before i started working in the specialty i probably felt the same i had no concept of how well managed it was how people who are on treatment for hiv cannot pass the infection on if your viral load is undetectable you cannot pass the infection on even if you try really hard you can't do it there's no virus um available in your bloodstream to, to move into somebody else's blood stream to infect them. So, I'm surprised, Sally, that you say even in 2024. So, look, I've worked in healthcare for 32 years. I was working at St. Bart's Hospital, St. Bartholomew's Hospital in 1991 when HIV and AIDS was absolutely huge. We had Dr. Anderson, who led the St. Bartholomew's HIV unit, who was the wife of Clive Anderson. And we used to work in the outpatients department and literally people would leave with like three, four, five carrier bags full of medicines. And I've seen my share of people with actual full-blown AIDS and opportunistic infections that often they died from. And now it's, I don't, I don't see, or I don't hear what you've just described. I actually do see the fact that we just treat it like another chronic condition. So yeah. Well, well, and that hopefully that's what most people do. Yeah. But, um, and I suppose you only notice the, the bad stuff, don't you, when it's sort of highlighted to you. The majority of GPs and doctors and nurses um, and um, healthcare professionals are aware that this is a, a chronic con- chronic infection. It's manageable by medication, um, and you know, pa- patients living with HIV are not a risk to other people. You know, there's no risk of transmission, but um, there's a wide there, there are lots of people in the community lots of people working in healthcare who still do not um, I'm just trying to think of an example we had one of our patients who um, was admitted for a minor operation um, a gynae operation and the healthcare support workers refused to change her bed sheets because they didn't want to come into contact with where she'd been lying. really yes Wow. And that happened within the last 12 months. I thought I was in the backwater of Dorset, but I'm obviously not. No. And, you know, it's just education. And that's that's the frustrating thing is um, a five minute conversation with with someone can just open their eyes to how unnecessary the stigma is. So, Sally, in my prep for tonight, which I 
don't know a lot about HIV because working in a district general hospital back in the 90s, we didn't see a lot of HIV. In my prep for tonight, I read this from Medical Anthropology. We are still here living with HIV in the UK. And it goes on to say that while medical advances mean that we can render the virus undetectable in the blood and therefore non-transmittable, as you, as you said, the social impact of living with HIV remains profound. Social rep responses to HIV remain mired in a past age. We'll put it in the show notes because it's a... It is an incredible read. Yeah. And basically you put, you read so eloquently what I was trying to say as I just bungled through the first five minutes of the podcast, but that puts it crystal clear. I often say to students or even to patients, the actual managing the HIV is relatively straightforward now. And, you know, the majority of our patients take one tablet a day. We've got patients who come in for um, long acting HIV injections they we see them once every eight weeks for their injections and they take no tablets in between and their virus is controlled so managing the virus is relatively straightforward what's difficult is is um, educating people to manage their lives to manage their emotions to manage the stigma around um, having relationships with people um, disclosing to people that they're living with HIV if you have a you know if you're on, in the dating scene if you're meeting people um and that's the main thing that people struggle with. In the dating scene, I love, I like how you put that. Yeah, sounds exciting, doesn't it? So <laughs> your job working with these patients, and what does it look like? Um, it depends. So um, if, if we have a new diagnosis um, or a new patient into the clinic, that's when um, my um, expertise regarding medication comes in. I'm responsible for educating the patient who may already have a background in HIV. They may have a lot of background knowledge. A lot of patients have no, have no concept, don't, don't have any real idea of what living with HIV is like. Um, I always explain to them the concept of having an undetectable viral load. We talk about what it means to have um, a healthy CD4 count. We talk about what it means to be immunosuppressed and again you know um, patients are as different as different patients come with a different set of um, backgrounds whether they're immune whether they've had a late diagnosis whether they've been diagnosed through illness or hospital admission or it's been a routine test or they've gone for sexual health screening so my um, education of those patients just depends on where they've come from and what their background is because i mean it must be quite difficult when we we you know, a common theme through the podcast has been about how, how patients manage complicated either drug regimes or information. I can imagine that's quite a lot to take in. Um, it is. So, and so, quite often, quite often, um, the, the patient sets their own pace as to when they want to start um, medication. As long as they're clinically well, as long as they are, they're not suffering from any obvious infections that need treating, or they're not showing obvious signs of immunosuppression or we let them decide when their head is right to start taking medication because it is a lifelong commitment so it may be like a couple of weeks we've got a counsellor that works in clinic who can talk to them about the sort of emotional impact of living with HIV um, and they really need to understand the science behind it how it why it is so important to take med medication every day um, we talk about the concept of resistance me trying to to explain to a me, a non, not very scientific pharmacist, because although I've got the background, you know, it's all a bit rusty now, but trying to explain the mechanics of drug resistance in the presence of sub-therapeutic drug levels to somebody that has no idea about drug levels, um, it, it can be a bit um, hilarious. It can be quite, uh, we, we get there. I've got, you know, I've got models and visual aids and all of these sort of things. We get there. So when they leave their appointment with me um, they will know that they need to take medication every day in order to keep the virus asleep once their virus is undetectable they can't pass the infection on um, if they run out of medication they stop dead they don't um, if they've only got a month's worth of medication left and they're not coming to see us for two months and they can't get more medication um, they stop after they stop when the tablets have run out they don't um, take them they don't try and string them out to make them last so if somebody was taking a tablet every other day for example or you know missing every third day those are the situations in which HIV resistance can arise so education is is paramount to make sure that they don't sort of end up with a resistant strain. I was just going to explain for the listener Sally that when you mentioned that these days people only take one medication one pill or one tablet 
course, what you mean, isn't it, is that there's lots of medicines, drugs within that one tablet or capsule, mm -hmm. isn't there? Yes. So as in when I was back in 1991 in St. Bartholomew's, you know, with the original AZTs, Idovidine, and then all the ones that came after that. But people would have to be having to take maybe five, six, seven different things just to try to suppress the virus. Whereas now, as you said, it's one medication, but it might have, oh, sorry, one pill, but it might have like three or four different medicines within it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, three is the gold standard. So three antiretroviral drugs. Um, there are certain regimes where we can use, just use two. Um, and so one tablet may have three or four drugs in, one tablet may have two drugs in. Um, we still use AZT, funnily enough. Do you? When we have, yeah, when we have babies born to mums who are living with HIV, um, the babies will have either two or four weeks of post-exposure prophylaxis. So they'll have AZT twice a day for either the first two weeks of life or the first four weeks of life. Um, we've had, I think we had five babies born to um, ladies living with HIV last year, all perfectly healthy, all perfectly fine yeah. Really. Um, so that's that's one of the things that I actually asked my kids. I've got um, older children. I asked one of my sons, would you consider having a relationship with somebody if they were living with HIV? And he was like, well, yeah, the only thing that would worry me was if we wanted to have children. I wouldn't want a child, my children to be born with HIV. And it was really lovely to be able to tell him that doesn't happen. You know, um, yeah. women who are um, virally suppressed when they uh, give birth there's less than a 1% chance of transmission, which is wiped out then by the post-exposure prophylaxis that the babies are given when they're born. It's moved on so much, hasn't it? And the Incredible. original antiretroviral drugs were also horrible, weren't they, for side effects? Mm. I mean, oh, yes. just, you know, when I talk about those those patients with those five carrier bags, they then had, you know, four or five other drugs just to deal with the side effects of yeah, the vomiting. drugs that they didn't want to take, they didn't want to not take, because mm -hmm. that was all that was available. And so it, they've come on in leaps and bounds, haven't they? Absolutely. The efficacy and the, and the safety of the of the new antiretrovirals. Yeah, the tolerability. We've, we've got patients now in their 80s who remember, who were patients in London uh, at the same time as you were in St. Bartholomew's, who have been through all the drugs. They've been through drug trials. They have, you know, they've got the... Um, uh, just a, a, when, you, when you go through their drug histories, they're like pages long of all these these drugs that we i mean i've read about them but we've never used them and the side effects were absolutely horrific yeah and listening to them is fascinating absolutely fascinating when we talked to one of our guests she was a, a kidney transplant patient and, and and that was one of the episodes where we you know she was describing how even i mean the medicines for that obviously much harder and much more side effects and stuff than than you're describing but even the threat of a kidney failure didn't meant she adhered with her medicine so i wondered do people adhere to their medicines as, as a rule or because I, I wonder as well is often it's harder to adhere to stuff when you're symptomless, isn't it? Because because you sort of can get quite blasé about a condition or. In general, our patients are they, they do adhere. You know, they are very involved in their care. They want to come. They we check them at least if they're well, they have their viral load checked every six months and they want to know that their viral load is undetectable. Um, if, if it's not, then they know that questions will be asked and you know that sounds that sounds scary doesn't it but there's no reason why they their viral load shouldn't be detectable but there's a, there's a process there that they're involved in isn't there what you're saying exactly. is that they're coming in they, they're maintaining regular contact with the health service yeah. um yeah. So, so so that that is going to help isn't it yeah and we are we're fortunate in that uh, and our patients are fortunate i suppose in that they have access to us when they need us so um we are very easy to get hold of via telephone. Um, if patients have got a problem, we can usually fit them in within a week, maybe, you know, sometimes even the next day. I was about to say, this is the exact opposite to when we were talking to Rory Kethlin Jones about people with Parkinson's disease. And I'm not for one minute trying to pair off one against the other. Please don't misunderstand me. But the point being that for part, you, you're talking about a population who have got access to some excellent holistic, multi-professional, multidisciplinary, regular, with the ability to catch up when they need to. And in Parkinson's disease, they don't have that. And so it's interesting, isn't it, to, to listen to that about the differences that exist between different conditions. I'm just going to say that, but say I'm not trying to make comparisons between the two because that would be wrong. Yeah, it's um, 
it's a really good feeling when somebody, you know, somebody's obviously relieved that they can speak to you about something that's that's been concerning them. Um, and I would hate to think that any of any of our patients were sat at home worrying, frustrated because they weren't getting a call back or because they couldn't get an appointment for the next three or four or five weeks. It would be awful. James, you kept very quiet so yeah. far. Well, only I've got two points really. One is that I'm surprised STC has been quiet because both Gimmo and Sally used the uh, medicine regime. Okay. Well, I didn't which want he, to pick Sally which he, up. Which, you well, know. which he oh. let pass. Mm -hmm. Do you want, do you want to you. give the public health announcement, Steve? Oh, yeah. So if the judge is listening from the movers and shakers, it's not a regime. That's what you have in countries where, you know, you've got conflict. It's a regimen. Come on, guys. It's a regimen. Oh, OK. Fair dues. Sally, I just know. cut and roll your eyes and move on. Yeah, here's okay. my. Oh, I um, didn't bring it up, Jamie. Did. Yeah, here's, here's my HIV um, story. And I'm going to take you back to the late 90s, early 2000s. OK. Uh, clinical governance had just come into vogue. It was just a new term introduced in STC is now voguing for the listener that the bless you can't see. <laughs> I was sharing an office with a governance facilitator at the time, looking after, we were looking after about 70 practices and it was Christmas. And one of the practices thought it would be a great idea to put a little Christmas message on their repeat slip. Yeah. The other side of the repeat. And this was, this was new in those days. People weren't using the repeat slip for messaging. Oh, the right-hand side of the prescription. The right-hand right. side of the prescription, yeah. Crazy. And so they, they sent a message to say Happy Christmas to all their patients. But sadly, in doing so, they copied two fields over at the same time. Now, they were blank in nearly all the patients, but one patient in one practice had a repeat slip that said, Happy Christmas, HIV positive. Oh, my God. Oh, no. Ooh. Yeah. That's tricky. That is very tricky. That was tricky. So it just shows you that even that, you know, that, you know, that well-intentioned, you know, let's write a message on 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 the repeat slip. Yeah, you have to be so careful. Blimey, out of interest, this um, we we no longer use the term HIV positive. We use the term people living with HIV because um, the term HIV positive has such a negative connotation, I guess. So that's the that's the acronym PL. WH, isn't it? P L, yeah, P L W H I V. Yeah, which we'll come on to in our micro discussion, I think. It's a better acronym than Beaver, anyway, isn't it? Beaver and Bash, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so how long has it taken us? We've got somebody on from sexual health, and we haven't yet lowered the tone. So, oh, we've got we've got plenty, plenty. There's plenty lower we can go. The other thing I remember from 1991 was when somebody first tried to explain to me about dental dams. But we probably shouldn't go into that right now. Well, <laughs> oh, go on. <laughs> um, I don't know whether this is going to just blow you all out the water, but I actually um, rendered somebody speechless the other day by informing them that they informing them that they could have gonorrhea of the throat. They had no concept that that was a thing. Hmm. Yeah. Well, every day's every day's a school day in sexual medicine, isn't it? Merry yeah. Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Have a dental right. dam. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Good link. Good link. The Oral Apothecary is sponsored by Jamie Hayes Executive Coaching and OneLessPill.com. Right. Sally, I'm sure we will come back later when we talk on the micro discussion, I'm sure, about other stuff to do with people living with HIV, because we know that language is important, particularly on the Oral Apothecary here. We like to get the right language and we like to acknowledge where we've got information from. Anyway, I'm sure you'll be aware that we're after three things from you as a guest. The first is a memory evoking drug. What would you like to give us? So um, the drug that I would like to give you is naloxone. Okay. Because uh, in my bio briefly, Jamie mentioned that I have worked in overdose prevention and I worked in a needle exchange um, with um, access, well, enabling patients who were not engaged in any sort of um healthcare services, uh, I would train them, give them one-to-one -one training on overdose prevention and then issue them with a list, with a package of their own naloxone kit. It was incredible when those patients came back to say they'd used their kit, they'd saved their best friend, their best mate's life, could they have another one? And uh, the year following the introduction of the, um, the naloxone kit initiative, the overdose deaths in Swansea decreased by more than half. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, that was just 
that that was just such an amazing statistic to be told at the time. And you know the naloxone uh, initiative's gone on and on. It's uh, it's amazing now. They're giving out all sorts, and um, there's lots of training and overdose prevention. But it's really it's really good to know that I was there at the start of that. When was that, Sally? That was in say 2011, 2012. So that's having an impact, Sally. Then with those uh, when somebody comes back to you and reports figures like that. Yeah. Oh well, even just to say, you know, I used that kit you gave me, and uh, I saved my friend's life. You know. Wow. Just for the listener that's been keeping up, you remember the lesson in the Rory Catherine Jones. He was asking me about agonist and antagonist. Essentially, naloxone is the antagonist at the opiate receptor, isn't it? So, and that's where it blocks all of that, and it means that it stops people from uh, uh, stops them from dying from stopping from breathing, basically. Opioid overdoses. So, yeah, I watched your video, Sally. Oh, did you? Still there on YouTube? Yeah. Oh, we'll put that. We'll, up. we'll put, yeah. put that, that in the link. <laughs> I don't because people will still think I look like that. It's and then today, I saw I saw today on Twitter then as well naloxone boxes going up everywhere. Yeah, that's really? what I was yeah, that's asking. what Sally's that's what Sally's yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah, amazing. That's what I was asking because it feels fairly recent that in my head it's it's quite last few last year or so you suddenly hearing about naloxone kits being everywhere. But what you're saying is it started in the mid two thousands and you're part of it. Yeah. One of my yeah. friends, Sally, he works for a council and he's been had the, he's had the training to de- deliver naloxone and he delivered some last year and he told us the story that he was one of the last to arrive at, at the scene and nobody had actually acted and so he just he acted on his training and um and the result was in, yeah incredible for there was you know there were bystanders there really and then he yeah. arrived council employee yeah not a healthcare professional Yep. And he said, no, no, this is what we've been trained for. And he, yeah. you know, where again, it, was, it sounded like there was a few people that... Stand know, back, yeah. no electric shocks, but yeah. Incredible story. Yeah. yeah. That a classic antidote, isn't it? A classic antidote. So plenty of them get given in hospital for other kinds of medicines as well. And when you give them, all of a sudden the person wakes up, you know, like... Almost Very like abruptly. That. And Usually, what? and they, they go, what did you do that for? That yeah. Was, that, that was yeah. a 10 bag. That was <laughs> yeah. my last tenner. So they either <laughs> swear at you, don't they? <laughs> They're very cross. <laughs> And then they get up and run away before the ambulance arrives. Yeah. And so that's important as well. On your video, you pointed that out, Sally, as well, isn't it? That Because um, how long is the naloxone lasting? Oh, uh, a few minutes. I could, do you know what? Don't, don't, yes. don't put me on the spot like that. Five yeah, minutes. you have to put up a drip and put an infusion up if yeah, you're not like... Yeah, because you've got to jab them again because they'll come around, they'll swear at you, and then they'll go over again. And then they'll leg it or... Yes, right. No, I was just thinking your expression of antagonists makes me think we could have a new feature, sort of Steve's Pharmacology Corner. <laughs> Please, <laughs> well, no. I think we need to come up with some alliteration there. You know, we like to get our alliteration yeah. and we need to work harder on that. Okay, well, I think that's the first antidote. I think that's the first antidote that we've had. So that's great. And it's just as well because there's quite a lot of opiates in the Desert Island drug choices of our guests. So I think that's an excellent choice. Okay, the second thing is a career anthem for the Spotify Oral Apothecary playlist. And follow me, it really is on Spotify. Yay. Well, I'm torn between two. Oh, Um, here we go. So... My first thought was Sex on Fire by Kings of Leon. Good tune. I know, amazing tune. And that was because uh, I love that song. And um, my ex-husband, who um, we're still very good friends, he used to play in a band and Sex on Fire was one of the best songs that they played. So that has lots of fond memories. And it also is related to sexual health. But then I thought... um, See what you did there? Yeah. Do you see what I did? It's not just thrown together. (laughs) But the one that I'm going to go for, because it always makes you smile, um, is by Salt and Pepper. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about baby. sex, baby. Let's, baby. Let's, talk, Let's about talk about you and, and, me. and me. Yeah, yeah that wow. one. <laughs> Salt and Pepper. Mm. Love that. Can't argue with that. Very Anybody good. got any, anything to say about that? You, you can't had, really follow that. Well, you could have had George Michael as well, couldn't you? What was the other song called? Sex, didn't he? Did he? Yeah. Did he? Yeah, I'll, I'll root it out. Fast. Okay. I think that was something to do with fast. That was when he was serving sentence, wasn't it? Yeah. For, for doing stuff in a toilet in America. Before we move on, look, it was, it's worth reminding the listener that at the live show we were able for the we were able to play the playlist, weren't we? And so as yeah. uh, as our guests filed in, as we were backstage waiting to come on, what were they treated to as the start of our playlist? Oh. Jimi Hendrix was blasting out. 
dignity was going. We came out to Mr. Pharmacist by the fall, didn't we? Despite we did. the fact we're not a pharmacy podcast. Yeah. I don't know. Well, you know, it was good. Yeah, there's enjoyed some, that. Yeah, there's some tunes on there. Okay, so that will definitely go into the Oral Apothecary Spotify playlist. Let's talk about sex, salt and pepper. And what about the book then for the Oral Apothecary Library? So this book I read not not that long ago and um it just moved me incredibly so i love an autobiography and this so the book that i've chosen is called friends lovers and the big terrible thing by matthew perry who was chandler on friends ah, of course and i got halfway through the book and he passed away and it was i felt i felt so sad for him because it, i got a part in the book where he was sort of really hopeful for the future and um it just it, it just and it just made it so obvious that so many people have got on the outside amazing lives, but so many are actually struggling with whether it's addiction, whether it's stigma, whether there's, you know, there's often you just need to ask the right questions and you will realize that not everybody's living the amazing life that they purport to be. So, yeah, that's that's that really struck a chord with me. So I really love that book. Yeah, because I remember reading some of his obituaries at the time and he. He suffered from mental health issues way before he yeah. came in. The show, he didn't he? Very, very sad. Yeah, he just he was always lonely. He he was he said he could never remember a time when he wasn't lonely, where he didn't feel abandoned. It's really, really sad. Yeah, I, I haven't read it, but I've heard other people. I mean, again, we're of an age, so Friends was well, not even just then. I mean, our children watch Friends all the time as well, and I heard people say that the book was very moving. And as you say, he was in a very dark place for a long time. And you just don't know what's going on behind someone's front door, essentially, do you? Mm -hmm. Actually, I suppose it, that, you know, it, 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 isn't it time to talk day today? Um, is it? So it is. I think I think so. I think it's um, I think it's today. It's, it's Mental Health Awareness Day or something. So it's, it's you know, worth, worth mentioning. Very good. So Friends, Lovers and the Big Terrible Thing by Matthew Perry will definitely go into the Oral Apothecary Library. It's not the first autobiography that we've had. Gents, who first picked an autobiography for the Oral Apothecary Library? Johnny Underhill? Yeah, Jonathan Underhill. Bruce and the book was? Prob probably Bruce Springsteen. No, it was. It was indeed. There you go. So, excellent choice. Thank you. Very good. Okay, our micro discussion next. We've touched on some of the issues already. We're looking at a systematic review as a start for 10, really. It's from Drugs and Aging in 2023. Aging with HIV, medicines optimization challenges and support needs for older people living with HIV. Uh, interestingly, they've defined an older person in this as somebody over the age of 50. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's like slightly outrageous. <laughs> yeah. How dare you, Sam? And it's by, yes, colleagues right. <laughs> at, it's by colleagues at Medway School of Pharmacy, Universities of Kent and Greenwich. Mm -hmm. uh, Priya Sama, Rebecca Cassidy, Sarah Corlett and Barbara Katsusim. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing Barbara Cern in there correctly. Apologies. And it's, well, the issues it highlights, look, it's things that we've all talked about on the oral apothecary in the in the six series so far. Comorbidities and health-related quality of life, polypharmacy, drug interactions and adverse drug reactions, adherence, treatment and medicine burden, stigma and need for social support, and then patient and healthcare provider relationships. What did you, not did, what did you make of the paper, uh, Sally? What were your comments on some of those those areas? So um, I was actually thinking back to when, even when I started as a HIV pharmacist, it was in 2013, um, the focus was a lot more on interactions and um, the we had a lot more challenges in getting people to have undetectable viral loads. That's a lot more straightforward now, but the challenges we face are managing uh, people's cardiovascular risk or managing people's diabetes alongside their antiretroviral medication um, and things like you know making sure that they're up to date with their flu vaccines and their pneumococcal vaccines and yeah so it's a lot more holistic and a lot more healthcare prevention um, I don't know if you're aware of the rapid guidance that Beaver issued in November 23 talking about how patients living people living with HIV um, have got an undi how do they word it uh, an unrecognized uh, underlying higher risk of cardiovascular disease than people without because of the inflammatory processes that go on due to the virus. Um, so they are now recommending that anyone over 40 living with HIV is offered a statin for primary prevention if they have a 
Q risk of less than five and everybody over 40 with a Q risk greater than five is recommended for a priority, although they are recommended to be prioritised for a statin. As is most of the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so now we can actually, so if patients are interested, we will initiate a statin in clinic and then ask their GPs to kindly can carry it on. Um, one of the things that I always tell patients when they come to us is that with HIV, when you're under our care, we're a very proactive specialty. So we will investigate, we will check your uh, lipids, we will check your liver function and we will do your blood, monitor your blood pressure. All, we will do, we will look for things that could go wrong. So prostates and kidneys and quite often we've had patients who've been diagnosed with things that can be managed long before they ever became symptomatic i mean that's probably true with lots of other specialties as well but the fact that they're being uh, checked over twice a year and having their bloods done twice a year um they get a lot of comfort from that yeah i'm glad you used the word holistic because that is my experience so i do lots of medication reviews for people on lots of medicines and i've got lots of patients who are people living with hiv and what i love about it is that what you've just said is that i will get these really good holistic level letters from the sexual health service and they are thinking about these things and i don't know if it's because the people who run them are the infectious diseases consultants because my my experience i don't know if that's true where where you work but my experience of infectious diseases consultants is they are very holistic. You know, they do consider everything and they're usually very good at what I call treatment regimens in that you know, they immediately look for things. And because you said about drug interactions, if they think, well, I can't use that because of this drug interaction, they'll just go to the next thing. They'll go to the second choice. And if that doesn't work because they've got that kind of contraindication, they'll move to the third choice. And they're very comfortable with that. But that doesn't require people to be holistic. So, yeah. But as, as I said at the beginning, and what this paper really says is that, hey, guess what? These people can live a very long and fulfilling normal life, and they're going to have chronic conditions. Even if they didn't have HIV, they could end up with these other conditions. And therefore, all of us that deal with these people have to be aware of that um, yes. because it's a thing. <laughs> it is a thing. Um, menopause as well. You know, we have yeah. a, aging in the menopause, HIV in the menopause. Um, yeah. And that was what I took from it was was... I was trying to, I was trying to think what's different here that would be for any patient in their fifties or sixties or seventies, and I suppose that's the message, isn't it? Is is what what we got better at, hopefully, is treating HIV as a chronic condition on a par with other chronic conditions, instead of instead of seeing it as something as, to be frightened of or as an outlier or something that we should be afraid to touch. Exactly. So one of the favourite things that I like. Um informing uh, clinicians of is one of the one of the main classes of drugs that we use called integrase inhibitors the way that they are metabolized and the way that they're removed from the body they will artificially elevate the creatinine level so um, they will uh, the drug competes with um, creatinine through the kidney tubules and elevates the creatinine not because of a decrease in kidney function but it's just a, a just a slowing down of the Anyway, whatever, whatever, however it does it, um, it elevates. So it can give an artificially low um, measurement of creatinine clearance. So and that's this week's pharmacology corner. <laughs> um, and I just made a complete hash of explaining it. But, you know, if somebody's concerned about their kidney, if a GP goes, oh, your kidney functions dipped a bit and they and, and I can say, well, actually, your your kidney function hasn't dipped a bit. It's just that because you, you're using a surrogate marker that's affected by your drug. That's why the that's why the figures are, are a little bit worrying, but they're not. I think the thing to say about you're right, Kimo, and, the, and why they use the the age greater than fifty, I think, in this paper, is what you have to remember is that this group is a bit like where we say, look, if lots of people in their seventies and eighties, we think of them as being multi morbid and lots of medicines, but actually, if you go and work in an area where there's very high levels of low of of social, poor socio economic class those people tend to get multimorbidity and polypharmacy earlier in their 50s and 60s. And so I read that this is really saying that this group tends to happen with the multimorbidity and the polypharmacy earlier, a couple of decades earlier, maybe, than people who don't have the condition. That's that's the way I kind of read mm. it. Am I right I, or wrong? Wrong. Okay, cool. Um, a, lot of, a lot of our patients are absolutely, they're fountains of youth. You know, we've got men coming in in their 70s that are 
at the gym every you know every oh no i didn't day. say that they i didn't say that they were i didn't say that they were frail i'm just saying that you know we've got lots of people in their 70s and 80s going to the gym i'm just saying that the data is that you know you you generally get that level of multiple medicines in your seventh and eighth decade whereas if you were if you're in an area where you where you've got poor um uh, socioeconomic background they tend to get more morbidity and more medicines earlier in their say 50s and 60s and the data is very clear on that across the across england patients in deep end practices they want to explain that to uh, the listener how can i so (laughs) the practices that are in in those socioeconomic deprived areas yeah and the the complexity of healthcare is things that we can't you know we just can't describe in in textbooks and lectures and when you come face to face with it it's very difficult to deal with it and so again those those patients are it, it's yeah you know, decades earlier that they experience the same um the same morbidity that that happens in other parts of the country I mean, we're going to do a session on deep end practices i think one day Hmm. The other thing I picked out of the paper was that it talked about what interventions were available, because that's one of the things it was looking at, wasn't it? So first of all, it was looking at, well, what have we got? So we said, okay, well, we've got people with lots of conditions and lots of medicines, you know, in their 50s and 60s and older, but in their 50s and 60s. And what it did pick out was that most of them were aimed at adherence, which is obviously this idea of trying to, like you said, you've come from a background of if you don't take them, you're going to get resistance, and therefore, you know, the HIV might might you know um, come come around again. And and actually, that doesn't, in my experience, that doesn't help then in a holistic sense because if you're just focused on the antiretroviral adherence, you're now missing quite a lot. Mm. And I think that's what comes out for me when they look at that and they say, well, actually, that we're mainly looking at adherence interventions, but there probably aren't any others. So along those lines, Sally, are you using any of the tech that's dis- or similar tech that's described in the paper? Um, we've tried it, you know, I mean, in terms of, uh, you mean like apps and phone reminders and those yeah. sort of things. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we'll always, rem- we'll always mention them to patients and we can recommend a couple. Um, I don't feel it's it, in, in my experience, it hasn't really been necessary. Uh, maybe because, you know, our patients are just very well educated and trained. I don't know. Um, but we, we don't have a problem with adherence. No, I'm, uh, I wish I could say I wish I could say we did, but we don't. So no need for stop, drop, and pop then. No, no, honestly. <laughs> is that one of the apps? That's, that's that one of called? the apps. Yeah. yeah, one of the one of the messages you receive for your um, antiretroviral therapy: stop, drop, and pop. But maybe that's because one of the things you talked about earlier was that you offer quite a a, a large level of pastoral support and and guidance because yeah. that 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 was the one difference that came out in the paper for me that that you might not see in in a paper about other chronic conditions was that it recommends high levels of of su- social support they call it don't they and 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 stuff like that and i suppose if you get in that support that's going to also help with the adherence yeah i mean the other thing i did notice in that paper is and it was 70 79 pages long when you sent it to me i was like oh my god yeah well the exact thing you said was this feels like an exam i hope you're not going to test me <laughs> yes and you bloody have um <laughs> but a, like a lot of the studies that they reviewed were from quite a long time ago you know some of them there's a lot from uh, like 10 years ago even five years ago we had lots more uh, patients on three tablet regimes whereas now um because the reg- the um, oh is it regimens what am i i forgot regimen regimen oh, because the regimens are so easy to follow and quite not forgiving but um they're the instructions they can and most of them can be taken with or without food we're sort of uh we've moved away from sort of the prescriptive you must take this for the meal you you know you must um take it before bedtime you know the side effects are a lot less a lot sort of um we don't get the horrible side effects that they used to get with the older drugs you know the vivid dreams the the psychiatric effects um most of the regimens that we use now are well tolerated and easy to take you know that's a bit that's a bit wishy-washy isn't it what i've just said no it's a, it's a nice thing to say i think but i think it's it's you know it, it the message of this uh, one of the messages of this pod is how much things have changed over the years but perhaps a lot of our perceptions are still stuck in the past yeah you know i i, I didn't appreciate that it was you know in my head i'm still 
picturing what Steve had is is people with lots of medication. Yeah, carrier bags. Shall we draw a line, I think? A big thank you to Sally for joining us on The Oral Apothecary, for sharing her stories, her Desert Island Drug, her career anthem and her book for The Oral Apothecary Library. Coming up next time, we'll be joined by Professor Tony Avery. Tony is the National Clinical Director for Prescribing for NHS England. He's also a GP in Nottingham and Professor of Primary Healthcare at the University of Nottingham. Join us next time on The Oral Apothecary. You can contact us via Twitter at Oral Apothecary. We're on LinkedIn. You can email us, oralapothecarypod at gmail.com. The website, uh, theoralapothecary.com. Gimo now for the final ingredient. Okay, so thanks, Sally. Thanks for coming on. Um, that was fantastic. Um, really enjoyed listening to that. And I actually, today's final ingredient, there is a very tenuous link with your drug choice, so it's not just thrown together. But I wanted to dive into the intriguing world of poisons, but with a twist. And so I was going to talk about Agatha Christie and her fascination with deadly concoctions. Can you remember, Steve, who the guest was who picked Agatha Christie or Jamie? Debbie Bhattacharya. It was, well done. So she chose one of Agatha Christie's books, but it was through the fascination, I think, with poisons. And so um, I want to describe how the Queen of Mystery used her pharmaceutical insights to craft captivating murder plots. And the reason I picked this up, I've just finished reading The Mysterious Affair at Styles, and that was her first whodunit um, that featured Hercule, Hercule Poirot. And he encountered the deadly consequences of a strychnine overdose, so the twist was that strychnine was used, what actually used, even though it's a poison, it was used as a tonic in the 1920s for appetite enhancement and nerve invigoration. However, a fatal error often occurred due to its tendency to concentrate at the bottom of the bottle. So when you took the last dose, you were taking a massive spoonful of strychnine. And so this was a known risk to pharmacists at the time. And Christie, having worked as a pharmacy dispenser, would have known this. And she weaves this knowledge throughout her stories. So some of the poisons she used, cyanide, arsenic, thallium, conine, phosphorus, and even biological agents like bacillus anthracis, which um, you know is a bacteria that, that her, her victim had administered to him by shaving. Um, medicines like belladonna and phytostigmine became lethal tubes and that lethal tools, and the latter was administered via eye drops. So she's not only up on the pharmacology, but she also understood drug delivery. And in one story, the murderer drinks from the same tea containing the drugs um, that she used to poison them to allay suspicion and then cured themselves by making themselves vomit with an emetic afterwards. So a real sophisticated knowledge of pharmacy. Morphine, veronal, sleeping tablets, etc., all appear in this repertoire. And even Poirot, meets his demise through heart disease as he places his amyl nitrate out of reach and so dies as a result of an angina attack. So there you have it, a warning perhaps to anyone who gets on the wrong side of a pharmacist. Sleep well. This was a Three Apothecaries production. Sound engineer, Jimbo Slough. Original music, Jamie Brewster. Artwork by David Baker. Thanks for listening to the Oral Apothecary podcast. Warning, harmless if digested. This episode of the Oral Apothecary is sponsored by onelesspill.com, a medicines optimization consultancy. Mm-hmm.